today is the busy day. If you want to buy Bitcoin, here is your chance. I'm going to place an order to buy Bitcoin. The price I'm looking to buy, 54,466. thousand four sixty six so this is the price I'm looking to buy Bitcoin so if you really 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 want to buy it this is the price to buy if you want to follow my trades and if you want to trade Bitcoin just to want to remind all of you that uh, we're not falling in love with any pairs or bitcoins or something. We just love them because they make us money. This is all. As soon as they will get into profit, we just sell it. We, are not, we don't hold them. So people who think that if they will purchase and they will hold it forever, uh, you better use other channels to advise you to do this kind of thing. We do not advise you to do anything at all because we're traders. We trade. If you want to follow our trades, you're welcome to follow. If you want to get the strategy we use, you're welcome to use it. But we don't give any advice. Okay? My colleague Danny Berger earlier on, she was looking at that. To the upside, Telecom is moving higher. Deutsche Telekom has been a gainer today, so Telecom up by eight tenths of one percent. Autos and Pars also doing uh, pretty well. So two reasons or two sectors that perhaps lift the German market a little this morning, and we're fairly flat on the DAX. Turning to the banking sector now, and the rising yield environment is a positive signal for lenders as it represents a pickup in growth and inflation. That's according to my next guest, who adds that it's premature, however, to discuss rising interest rates in the UK and the Eurozone. Joining us now is Joseph Dickerson, Jeffrey's International. Okay, guys, so I got to cancel Japanese yen order because it moved, as you can see. Unfortunately, it moved to another direction and it's too far away from our order. So I'll better cancel it. So you have to cancel too. And let's wait for another chance to place an order and get filled. Uh, deflation uh, signal uh, globally. In terms of fundamentals, of course, it impacts the U.S. banks uh, mostly um, in a direct way. Um, but the fact that global growth is returning and you have higher um, growth prospects and reflationary prospects, that is uh, positive for uh, uh, banks globally. And that's occurring at a time when their relative valuations are um, historically low uh, relative to the markets in pretty much every geography. Yeah. So do you look at this? Do, do bank bosses look at this positively because of what it says about underlying economies, Joe? Because it says that we're seeing recovery in economies and therefore the curve can steepen, growth expectations are improving. Or do bank bosses look at this and say, uh, this is good because it, it plays well for our business. You know, we can make more money through lending oper uh, uh, operations as a result of this. Uh, certainly in, in the UK and Europe, in terms of can they make more money on lending operations, you really need to see the short end rise, but they can certainly make uh, more money on their reinvestment portfolios, excess deposits, in other words, the liquidity that they hold, they can um, invest at different points uh, in, in the curve to the extent that they have mandates um, that allow them to do that. Um, but um, the fact that it portends a big, larger economic growth uh, is generally taken positively um, by bank managements. And you can see why, uh, for instance, the curves are moving. I mean, if you look at you know, our economist uh, took his UK GDP forecast for 2022, uh, you know, recently upgraded that to 7.6%. Um, and that is something, if you think about loan growth uh, potentially being higher than that, that's the, these are very big numbers that banks haven't seen uh, at, at any point uh, since uh, the GFC. I'm placing a stop on profit for euro at 118.79. Okay, I'm going to place, and if you follow the trade, you have to place stop and profit at 118.79. Okay, we're already in profit, whatever, like I'm always saying, whatever happened, if the momentum will change and if the price change direction, we will 
not get loss. We will be in profit. Okay? By the way, for the time being, uh, I'm going to cancel the order to sell my previous holdings at 118.60.6. I want to keep them. So I will cancel this order to sell. And I will hold only one order to sell. Euro that we just purchased a couple of what a couple of minutes, 20 minutes ago. So it's already in profit. So uh the order placed to sell if the price will change its direction. I'll speak to you later, guys. Let's focus in on the UK for a moment then, Joseph. Uh, when I look at what we've heard from the Bank of England recently, there's been an emphasis on slack in the economy, pointing to the weak spots in the economy, the jobs that, that are not there, that were, or the jobs that might go as a result of the, uh, the furlough uh, coming off later on this year. So where does that leave us in terms of expectations for, for interest rates and therefore the banking sector in the UK? Well, I think if you look at the, at the budget, um, I think it's hard to see... Um, scope for uh, negative rates because there's quite a lot of uh, stimulus um, in that budget. I also think on the furlough scheme that the furlough scheme is going to have to continue to be um, adapted and uh, rolled on uh, for some time, whether it's September. I'm going to move even further my stop on profit for order at 118.77. I'm going to move to 118.82. Okay, I move even further. Lower house prices, higher unemployment, and uh, slightly uh, lower economic growth in most uh, instances, depending on the bank. So, in, in terms mm. of the balance sheet risk of the banks, you know, it's um, it's it's pretty conservative versus the economy. So that brings us back to then, you know, where's the revenue? Uh, going to come from, and that is going to be this year a tale of two halves. It's going to continue to come from uh, mortgage activity and capital markets in the first half, and in the second half, as economies uh, reopen and you have greater non-essential um, card spend growth, you should see a pickup in uh, card lending, and that's a that's a very powerful impact for banks such as Barclays um, or Lloyd's, mm, yeah, which are the two largest uh, card names in the UK. That's an interesting picture that you paint there, Joe. Just, just briefly then, negative interest rates. Are UK banks still preparing for that possibility or is that now off the table? Uh, banks are still preparing uh, for that possibility. Um, uh, they certainly didn't talk about it a lot at their uh, Q4 um, earnings, but they certainly, um, you would expect them uh, to be preparing for that in the event that it happens. It is being talked about um, you know, at the Bank of England. There are still quite a few... Uh, doves out there um, uh, at the Bank of England. So it is something that the banks have to uh, prepare for. And it is something that most banks uh, in the UK have a European operation where they have dealt with negative rates um, already. So there is an institutional knowledge of how to deal with negative rates, which if you compare that to banks in Asia where they haven't seen even zero rates or you know US regionals where you haven't seen zero rates, they're still digesting that uh, both uh, from a revenue standpoint and a processing, you know, processes uh, standpoint. Mm, some cross-border learning going on then, Joe. Thanks very much for joining us. Yes. Good to speak to you, Joe Dickerson, Jeffrey's Thank International you. Managing Director. Coming up on the program, how should we value green stocks? We put that question to Morgan Stanley's Jessica Alsford. She joins us next. This is Bloomberg.
women leaders were actually better at controlling the deaths from COVID-19. Do you think out of this pandemic, we'll see more countries be willing to elect female leaders? When we look at women leaders, we tend to project on them baggage that they shouldn't bear. Women are given an opportunity when no one else wants to do the job. Women had a very clear objective. Uh, they wanted to save lives. The women leaders, if you look at their careers, have also built up a level of, of trust. In fact, women have to be better at communication in order to be elected uh, as leaders, whereas this doesn't hold true for men. We need to get those sexist stereotypes out of our head and give women a fair run for leadership. Trying to change the stereotypes about women is not only the business of women, but men have to be part of it. in the beginning of 2021, what are your biggest worries? The inequality of the current world environment. It's troubling, and I think it's, uh, it's actually getting worse, which is a big challenge. Welcome back to the European market open. 41 minutes into a European trading session that is entirely unchanged. Yesterday was uh, perhaps busy enough for everybody. NASDAQ futures now point uh, just slightly to the downside, not by much. Dow futures a touch higher this hour. Let's get a Bloomberg business flash. Here's Laura Wright. Thanks, Anna. A group of hackers say they've breached a trove of security camera data collected by startup Vercada, gaining access to live feeds of 100,000 surveillance cameras. That includes footage inside hospitals, companies, police departments, prisons, and even schools, as well as car maker Tesla. Vercada says the internal and external security are working on the issue and it's notified law enforcement. Grab is looking at going public in the US through a merger with a blank check company. Bloom both sources say the Southeast Asian ride-hailing and delivery giant is speaking with JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley to identify a possible SPAC for the deal. We're told a traditional IPO is not entirely off the table, no official comment yet. Two of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds are warning investors to expect much lower returns in the future. In part, that's because the typical 60-40 balance of stocks and bonds doesn't work well in the current rate environment. Singapore's GIC and Australia's Future Fund say the days of bonds acting as a buffer against equity market risks are over. Bloomberg sources say Greensill Capital's plan to sell parts of its business to Apollo-backed Athene Holdings has been derailed. That's after banks, including JP Morgan, extended a lifeline to a key technology partner of the collapsed lender. We're told the deal is now unlikely. Losing the tech supplier makes Greensill a less attractive target. Citigroup is punishing investment firms that kept Okay, traders, as you can see, we opened position on Bitcoin just right here. So let's follow these. It, uh, I can't even call it pair. Yeah, let's call it the... Uh, ah. It's still Bitcoin. People trade, so people like it. So, but this is not fair. It's bit, actually it's fair. It's compared to Bitcoin versus dollar. Yes. So you can say it. it uh, let's follow this pair: Bitcoin versus United States dollar, and let's see how much Bitcoin will make us profit. Just to remind you, we trade, uh, we measure our profit when we trade Bitcoin, not in pips, in per, per, percentage-wise. So 0 0.1%, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so on. So position opened, and let's follow this trade.
Head of Global Sustainability Research. And Jess, I imagine this is something you give quite a lot of thought to, the size of the investable green market, what exactly is a green investment and what is not. And I imagine it depends very much on the, on the mandate of the investor involved. What's your latest thinking on that? That's right, Anna. It really does depend on how you want to define it. I think the easiest way to, to really try to um, get to the bottom of it is, are you thinking about the products that that company is, is selling, or are you thinking about how that company is managing its operations? And what we've really seen for the first bucket is a huge emphasis on those green technologies. So technologies like renewable energy, electric vehicles, biofuels, hydrogen. On the other side though, there's a huge amount of emphasis on companies reporting and disclosing their, their scope one, two and three emissions. So not just those emissions that they're directly responsible for, but also the greenhouse gas emissions throughout their supply chain. And the SFDR regulation that you mentioned just now is, is really a step forward to try and, and get more uniformity of this disclosure um, from corporates and, and also from the asset management industry as well. Uh, that's interesting. And so, Jess, will these new regulations, will it make it easier for, for us to establish the value of, of assets in the utility space, materials, industrials? Will really getting visibility of that scope one, two and three help to value these things better? I think the valuation really comes down to what is the outlook for the, the growth and the returns of a, of a business, um, as with, with any investment analysis. And, and so I think really when you're coming to look at how to value green stocks, it's about thinking about the future demand. So how much renewable build-up do we need in order to get to a net zero economy? And, and conversely, what will the impact therefore be on, on fossil fuels? Uh, and so these are the types of questions that, that we on the, on the sell side research, but also investors, are really trying to get to the bottom of. Uh, and what really is driving the share prices in, in many of those sectors. And Jess, you say in your notes that one of the common questions you get from investors recently is, are we in a green bubble? What's, the, what's your assessment of that? It's, over the last year, we've seen a phenomenal re-rating of green companies, as, as I guess we put them in a, a bucket. And it, it's actually quite a diverse group. You've got everything from uh, EVs, battery manuf manufacturers, um, you've got um, industrials companies, chemical companies, but all what they have in common is they are providing green solutions. And for that bucket of stock to the end of January, we're seeing sort of an average re-rating over the last 12 months of around 22, 24 PE multiple points. If you look at the, the non-green sector peers, that re-rating was more sort of two to four times on, on average. And so clearly there was that big re-rating. Now, some of it we think is absolutely about the change in, in regulation. You had the EU Green Deal, you had um, US policy looking more supportive of climate. You've had um, China announcing their net zero emissions targets and this all helped to um, really boost the growth outlook for a lot of those technologies. Um, the question is always and when does evaluation become um, too expensive and too much growth is, is baked in. What we have seen though over the last few weeks is actually a real pullback in, in some of those green areas and I think that's partly just due to a broader market rotation away from growth and into more value type companies and I think also there is more of a debate now as well about just how um, sustainable some of the returns are. There's the growth, but um, there's more and more companies really trying to get exposure to green growth and um, are returns going to be sustainable in, in that mm. type of environment. So in some senses, you can see that certainly the investment community is taking this, this investment theme very seriously, Jess. I wonder if money managers are, are, are voting in a way that reflects that seriousness. I'm drawn to a story by one of my colleagues that says that most money managers, there's some, been some research done that he cites, most money managers still fail to back climate resolutions. And it looks at some research that looks at voter, uh, the way that shareholders and money managers as shareholders vote uh, at certain board meetings. And in many cases, 
this research finds that they don't back these ESG resolutions. Is that just because we don't have the right ESG resolutions broadly, or is it, or is it that there's a lack of seriousness when it comes to actually voting around this stuff? I think as with everything, there's a number of reasons for, for these trends. Um, I would say that um, I think where the climate transition story and, and the green story has really gained momentum is because it is um, sustainability funds that have got behind it, but it's also been mainstream investors as well, really seeing how this is a, a mega trend that's playing out in the markets. Um, I think on the, the voting side, certainly we're seeing more and more investors wanting to um, to, to, to use their, their position to be able to engage with companies and, and help them with the transition. Voting is clearly one way that that can materialize, but we also know that there's a, a lot of engagement going on behind the scenes as well to really help push companies towards um, decarbonizing and, and contributing to reaching this net zero emissions target. Jess, thanks very much for your time. Good to speak to you. Jess Oldsford, Morgan Stanley, Head of Global Sustainability Research. Coming up on the programme is Trader Central Bank Divergence Perilous. We will uh, consider that question, put it to Laura Cooper, Bloomberg's Markets Live macro strategist. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2-neutral uh, mobility, so we have flicked the switch there, and really uh, we're going to step-by-step step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. Trading revenues coming in better than expected. Everything. Cash. $1.4 trillion of cash. One of the most notable aspects of this report that was stellar. Welcome back to the European market. Open 53 minutes into a session that's not moving all that far at the net level. You can see some divergence, basic resources weighing on the FTSE 100, that market to the downside. Elsewhere, gains for, in particular, the Cat Caron in Paris. Joining us now for more on the markets, Laura Cooper, Bloomberg Markets Live macro strategist. And I want to get to the question of the day then, Laura, because we haven't uh, thought about this much uh, in the last hour or so. Uh, the question is, is trader central bank divergence perilous. And I suppose this uh, sets up everything we've been talking about around yields on treasuries and inflation expectations. Are we asking here whether traders see inflation and rates on the rise, central banks don't see things that way? Uh, are we setting up that kind of uh, different viewpoints and asking then where that leaves markets? What kind of uh, thoughts do you have on this question? 
Well, I think certainly that, that tug of war that we're seeing between central banks and traders anticipating that they're going to have to tighten policy sooner than kind of current guidance suggests is really the key thing for, for the key market conundrum right now. So markets are anticipating that we could see a strong bout of sustained price pressures, but really central banks are dismissive of that for now. So we had the RBA overnight just stand, stand their ground, really, saying that they're not going to raise rates until at least 2024. And that contrasts with markets anticipating at least one rate hike over the coming two years. Now, we have the Bank of Canada later today, a very similar story. And as we know in the Fed, the Fed wants to keep rates unchanged for some time, yet markets are potentially potentially forcing them at some point to capitulate so long as we do see these yields continue to climb, so long as we do see markets continue to price in these rate hikes. And, and you know, it remains to be seen, really, it's just this wild card of inflation. And CPI yeah, forecasts don't, don't show that yet. Yeah, it's really interesting to think how that feedback loop works. You know, if central banks keep pushing back against inflation expectations, saying that's not what we see, then investors go out and buy commodities and maybe that drives some inflation and then we do see it. Let's think about inflation then, Laura, because because we have U U.S. inflation out later. I've been on the Waco function, tells me uh, what's expected in these markets. This is going to be crucial. Plus, we have the, uh, the auction, of course, in the Treasury markets. Ten-year, I think, today. So we've had kind of the bond sell-off take a bit of a, a reprieve lately, and I think that does set up potentially for fireworks later today. So like you mentioned, we do have that 10-year Treasury auction. Will we see kind of that sail through with robust bids, similar to what we saw yesterday in the three-year? And then, of course, we have that U.S. CPI print. Now, the February gauge is won't yet capture those year-on-year -year base effects from the oil collapse last year, but we are expected to see a strong surge in energy prices through through gasoline. So that should bolster that headline gauge to the highest that it's been in about a year. So if we do see even further upside pressures to that, that could certainly mm. shake up what we're seeing in yields. And we could see that, that sell-off resume once again as pr traders price in more of those inflation risks. Laura, thanks very much. Laura Cooper, Bloomberg Markets Live, macro strategist. Lots to look out for later today then when it comes to those Treasury auctions and when it comes to the data. We'll look for the, uh, the data on inflation out of the United States. That is it for the European Market Open. Surveillance Early Edition is up next. European equity markets taking a pause for breath, it seems, right now. U.S. futures uh, point modestly to the upside. This is Bloomberg. It's time to move even higher stop on profit for euro. I'm going to move to 118.87. Just right here. Okay. We have already 10 pips in profit.
It's such an interesting new world. The world is changing. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. While everyone is zigging, we're zagging. We feel like we can maybe help people out more. We have an enormous number of big ideas. Right now, about half of U.S. households invest. We'd like to get that number up to 95 plus percent. It should just be something that people do. I have asked the Securities and Futures Commission and the Hong Kong EX to work together to explore the viability of our own Hong Kong version of SPACs. We remain very confident on the competitiveness of the Hong Kong stock market. which has changed compared with December is the 1.9 trillion US stimulus that will lift and global GDP growth by about a full percentage point. Emerging markets are going to benefit from that. China, India. The risk of doing too little to help American families outweighed the risk of doing too much. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition on Wednesday, the 10th of March. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Bounce back. Tesla leads the resurgence in high valuation stocks overnight, driving the Nasdaq to its biggest advance since last November. But can it maintain momentum? The big breach, Silicon Valley, suffers its second cyber attack in almost as many days. Hackers gain access to 150,000 live surveillance cameras in hospitals, prisons, and Tesla's offices. Plus, Jake Morgan hosts its annual Chief Executive Officer Forum today. We'll be joined by the company's EMEA Chief Executive, Vis Raghavan, shortly. And then the NL Chief Executive, Francesco Starace, also joins us ahead of the event. Well, first thing is first, of course, the obsession with inflation has dominated the markets over the last couple of weeks. So let's get straight to the markets. High-value stocks staged a revival overnight. Now, after slipping into correction territory, the Nasdaq bounced back like a coiled spring, closing 4% higher. Now, that was led by gains in Tesla, which surged to some 20% on Tuesday's session, adding $25 billion to Elon Musk's wealth in a single day. Amid this equity market madness, yesterday's three-year U.S. Treasury auction stood out, even though yields were Remain high. The sale drew the strongest demand since June of 2018. So let's get more. Sale drew the strongest demand since June of 2018. So let's get more on all of this with our Danny Berger. Danny, what do the markets actually look like today after the up and down that we saw in the last three day, uh, you know, trading sessions? Yeah, I have to say it looks pretty muted compared to what we saw given the dramatic moves. I, yesterday, if you look at momentum in the U.S., for example, it was its biggest gain since 2008. So considering that a move of six basis points on Nasdaq futures, that's not much at all. It did start negative on the day, so a slight turnaround. But I think if you look at it compared to Europe, which is up one-tenth of a percent, you're still getting hints that value is outperforming growth, which would indicate those higher yields, that concern about inflation, and just the growth cycle. If there's more growth than those high flyers, those momentum stocks, they're not the only game in town. So it'll be interesting to see what Tesla and those type of stocks do throughout the session. Of course, how the session unfolds is going to be a lot of uh, 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 dependent on two big events over the next two days, and that's the auctions, Francine. You mentioned the three-year yesterday. The fact that that was so well-received really meant that it was an impetus for people to go in and buy the dip. Today, 10-year year, year auction, $38 billion. Tomorrow, we get 30-year. Uh, how those perform are going to be important because, remember, last time we got this huge spike in yields, those inflation concerns, people weren't comfortable with it, came off the back of a poor auction. So, how much strength we see today is going to mean a lot for markets, Francine. Of course, CPI out as well. Danny, thanks so much. Danny Berger there with some things that we're watching. And of course, CPI is going to be a big one. And that will give certainly a lot of financial muscle uh, to some of this maybe rotation or not. Now, joining us to talk about the markets is Viswas Raghavan. He's JP Morgan EMEA chief executive. He joins us as uh, the investment bank is hosting its annual chief executive officer forum in Europe. It brings together hundreds of C-suite clients across the continent to discuss the challenges and opportunities for business, including the pandemic recovery, the UK's future relationship with the EU and climate change. So, Viz, thank you so much uh, for 
joining us. I know it's a, it's a big day for JP Morgan as you try and kind of you know talk about all of that in, in little time. Because when you look about the great you know the rotation and actually all of the chatter about inflation that's really dominated the markets, what are you seeing in the markets nowadays? I mean, look, Francine, good morning, and, and thanks for having us uh, uh, on, on this day. Uh, look, I think what we are seeing in the markets is, first of all, a phenomenal wall of liquidity. I mean, the market is awash with money, and you are basically seeing every asset class being chased, you know, pretty aggressively by, by investors. Uh, what, what, you, what you are also sensing is kind of the first kind of the niggling kind of signs of inflation coming in. Uh, your colleague commented on this earlier. And, you know, when you look at our own assessments, I mean, we see global GDP in the quarters to come around 7.5%. We see inflation, global inflation, core inflation around kind of 3% in the quarters to come. So, yes, I mean, there are, there are the kind of the initial signs that, you know, the economy is, is the markets at least are, are, are really, you know, have responded really well uh, post-COVID and, uh, and fears of inflation are on the horizon. So, Viz, what does it mean for the kind of zigzags that we can see on the markets? What does it mean for your traders? Are, are we going to see this rotation continue? Is it something that you get asked about often from clients? I think yeah, you, you will see an element of rotation continue because the reemergence of a yield curve means, you know, banks, financial institutions, et cetera, are going to really benefit from a, a more NII and the like. But what is also very much the theme here is the incredible stimulus we have seen. If you look at the, uh, the, uh, the last count, I mean, we are talking about you know, 10 to $12 trillion of quantitative easing that's been injected into the system. We have fiscal stimulus. So all of this money is going to underpin and sustain asset prices. So we are still really bullish on equities. We do see a recovery theme continue. We see GDP growth continue. I think there is pent-up demand. I mean, if you take the consumer who has been bottled up in, in lockdowns and the like for the best part of a year now, I think there is really a, a desire to go out and go consume, go spend, start living again. So all of this points to a kind of a healthy economic uh, recovery. So we are still, we are going to see uh, sustained uh, interest in equities. You are continuing to, you're going to see an element of rotation happen. But also remember, when you look back at this crisis, I mean, we will clearly look at this as an inflection point where we well and truly embrace the digital age. So technology is kind of more than just kind of, you know, uh, episodic kind of activity. It's pretty much yeah. now uh, present. It's omnipresent. So tech stocks will clearly you'll see kind of, you know, rally correction, rally correction. But tech as a theme is an overriding theme in the marketplace today. Just, just one other point I'd make is if you look at, you know, the UK itself, we have three tech IPOs in the market. You know, we are working on the Deliveroo IPO. Uh, Trustpilot is out there. So really, you know, when even you look at the primary activity, tech is very much an, a, a theme that's out there. But, um, Viz, when you talk about, you know, some of the tech stocks and you say, you know, rally correction, rally correction, at what point does it stabilize? So, you know, when do we know if we've hit the, the correct valuation when it's no longer too lofty? I would say, look, I, I would, I would almost kind of point to valuations in the in the context of the investment thesis, the equity story, and the and the future growth potential. So it it really kind of varies. So if you look at uh, some of the themes that are emerging in in tech, you know, especially around EV, autonomous driving. Uh, likewise, you know, what the pandemic has shown is a real kind of a drive to, you know, technologies in medicine, whether it's med tech, life sciences, biotech. So some of those themes are really now part of the way we consume, the way we live. And what you will find is it really is a function of the growth potential, the upside potential, and the investment thesis in these, in these stories. So this rally correction scenario, some of it is macro driven, some of it is really driven by the investment outlook, you know, the quest for yield. Remember, we still despite kind of the, the talk of a, uh, a more robust yield curve emerging, I mean, real uh, interest rates are, are very benign. I mean, you're talking very yeah. low, zero, negative in most jurisdictions. So the quest for yield continues. So this, this volatility that you see is really going to be a function of, you know, more, you know, single name uh, led. It's going to be more kind mm -hmm. of thematic as the quest for yield evolves. But I would kind of say overriding all of this, you know, healthcare technology and the undercurrent that is very much every industry is now driven and fueled by uh, the tech revolution 
that team is very much here to stay. Um, Viz, what does it mean for the great rotation, actually, in treasuries? Do, does, is the most important call as a market participant now to make the, that you get the treasury call right? I mean, I mean, look, I, you know, you, you, will, you will gradually see this rotation happen. I don't think it's going to be seismic. Uh, whether it's, you know, whether you go into 10 years today, I mean, question is out whether now's the right time. Do you hold off and you wait, you know, for, for some time before you pile into kind of 10-year uh, bonds, et cetera? So I would kind of really, you know, time it, pace it. Uh, it, is, it doesn't have to be knee-jerk. It doesn't have to be, you know, all or nothing. And really, you have to be astute. I mean, this is going to be rally correction. Nobody's anticipating a crash. And really, it's all about making your mar market movements, you know, really based on, predicated on timing and reacting to single name investment thesis. I would not kind of really look at it in a very binary fashion. Uh, Viz, could the demise of Green Seal actually be systemic? Um, look, I would say that I, Green Seal is going to be much more contained. Um, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, just this morning, you know, there's been talk of uh, Tolia, uh, with whom, uh, who, you know, who had a legacy supply chain uh, funding arrangements with, with Green Seal. And uh, Tolia is a strategic partner for us. We, we took a strategic investment in them over a year ago. And, and really, I think what we, what we did was, you know, step in, uh, with, a, with, a, with a funding uh, commitment to really help Tolia and, and Tolia's uh, many, uh, very many supply chain clients. So I would say, you know, w as it regards to Green Seal, I mean, I, 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 I don't think it's going to be systemic. Uh, various players in the market uh, will step in, and effectively the liquidity in the system and the strength of the financial system will assimilate, you know, uh, failures uh, of, of this order. Uh, is there anywhere, you know, any other part of the market that's attached to Green Seal, which you, you could see J.P. Morgan having to step in? Look, I mean, this is an evolving situation, so I will, I would rather not comment mm -hmm. on that. But uh, Tolia is an example of where we effectively, you know, supported our strategic partner and and Tolia's clients. Viz, thank you so much, Viz Raghavander of J.P. Morgan stays with us, and <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit more about working from home. As well, now, Smart Conversations on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Later on in the show, we'll be speaking exclusively to one of the chief executives of the world's biggest alcoholic drinks makers. My voice is gone. It's probably what I need right now. Maybe a uh, gin and tonic or something like that. Ivan Menezes of Diageo joins us. But before then, we'll also have a chat with Francesco Storace of Enel. This is Bloomberg. trade travels by sea. At any given time, around 5,000 ships are on the ocean carrying containers. Without them, the global economy would collapse. Many of those containers pass through here, Singapore, the world's second largest port. The industry accounts for 7% of the country's GDP. But the industry is under pressure. The uneven recovery from the pandemic is creating a shortage of containers where they're needed most driving bottlenecks at major ports. It sent freight prices soaring. Since the beginning of COVID-19, these are levels of shipments that we've never seen before. Chinese New Year marks a seasonal time for freighters when rates are renegotiated for the next year. Companies must choose whether to swallow the financial hit or pass on the cost. It's a decision that could bring new headwinds of the global economic recovery. Generation's biggest problem. Climate change is happening. And the world's most innovative solutions. Transport, industry, uh, buildings, electricity, all of those things. Everything you need to know about our changing environment, the politics of global warming. We can and we will deal with climate change. In the fight against climate change, 
Bloomberg Green has you covered. back and have every single individual coming into the office five days a week feels to me a little bit like a wasted opportunity. So, you know, whilst we have had a core number of people that have been coming in throughout the entire pandemic because it was not possible for them to do their jobs from home, so particularly on our trading side um, and in terms of our tech space, there's also great numbers of people for whom actually a more flexible working pattern actually is something that they welcome. So whether it be at the beginning of the pandemic or actually most recently, the feedback that we've had from our people um, actually tells us that they want to work at least one to three days from home at some point in the future. So that doesn't mean for everybody, uh, but certainly I think that is something which we'll be looking to explore in the coming months and years. Well, that, that was the Deutsche Bank UK and Ireland Chief Executive Officer uh, Tina Lee speaking on this program on Monday. Deutsche Bank may let staff work from home between one and three days a week, so is remote working a trend that's here to stay? Well, we're back with Vizwa's Raghavan of JP Morgan, who's still with us. Viz, when you look at working from home, does it depend on how country, uh, you know, how fast a country can vaccinate? So, is your working from home expectation different in the UK compared to Germany and France? Uh, absolutely, Francine. Um, so clearly, I mean, we've, we've, we've been big advocates of, you know, vaccinations really kind of getting, kickstarting the whole kind of the revival of, uh, a, a, you know, people, folks getting back into the office. Um, but, but what is very clear and what the pandemic has proven to us is how efficient uh, we can all be. I mean, we process record volumes, uh, you know, through the dark days of the pandemic uh, effectively. Uh, you saw, uh, you know, most folks uh, really kind of, you know, from a home, home you know, you, we, we talked about homeschooling and you know, juggling uh, work life and, and, and kids and family, et cetera. And, and we processed all of that. And, and what we see now with this kind of vaccine impetus is really, you know, some degree, some semblance of normalcy slowly coming back into the way we, you know, conduct our daily lives. And, and, and as you said, I mean, it's not one size fits all, depending on how, you know, every jurisdiction, how they, where they are in this evolution, I think uh, they will kind of come along. Uh, what is very clear is uh, we are very much looking at some form of a rotational model where mm -hmm. you draw on the best experiences of the uh, working from home regime during the pandemic. You, you really still kind of try and preserve the camaraderie and the creative uh, you know, input that comes from a, a, a work environment and really try and kind of, you know, match and marry the best lessons learned from both to have a kind of a, a future RTTO plan. Um, let's also talk about SPACs, which is, you know, the, the big new thing that everyone's been talking about for the last couple of months. What is it? Is it a new asset class and what does it mean for JP Morgan? Look, I haven't had a single discussion recently where uh, SPACs wasn't, uh, wasn't a topic. I mean, look, this is very much a, a, a very visible, real tool. Uh, it is part of the, the uh, corporate finance toolkit today. Uh, if you look at the, the numbers, they are staggering. I mean, it, whole of last year, we had about 230 deals in the United States raising in excess of you know, $80 billion. Uh, you know, this year we've had, uh, you know, in January alone, uh, over 100 deals raising $20 billion. So that's kind of the sheer kind of volume of liquidity, money, uh, chasing these SPAC opportunities. I think the key here is, uh, the, 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 the key here is the de-SPACing effort. So the SPAC itself, mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it is, a, it is a capital raising exercise. It's a, a commitment exercise. But really, the, the genius is in not just raising the SPAC, but the genius is in, in, in de spacking and the pipes and the investment ideas that, that come through. And here, I think the focus really... Ha no, does it just Sorry, show that there's too much capital in the world? Is, it, is there too much, abund you know, is it too abundant? Oh, absolutely. It once again, you know, points to the point we raised earlier. I mean, the amount of liquidity that is in the system is, is staggering. I mean, when you look at the stimulus and the QE, et cetera, 
there's a lot of money looking for you know investment opportunities. So uh, you know, absolutely. Um, if is it, you know, you're also expanding your retail bank beyond the U.S. You're coming here in the U.K. Are there any other countries where you want to, to be part of? Look, I think the, the the digital bank in the in the UK is is really you know the our first foray outside of uh, the United States. Uh, it is a, a, a digital offering uh, ground up. Uh, the UK is a is a great market in which to uh, in which to kind of you know test our offering. I mean, it is sophisticated. Uh, it is well banked. Uh, you have a fantastic regulatory framework. So really, I think you know we want to make sure that you know our we want to see it's in it's in pilot stage right now. We want to see how it's received and and really reserve our ambitions based on how uh, the launch in the UK pans out. So we are super excited about it. Um, Viz, just going back to SPACs, are you expecting this to to grow even more from here? Is there any you know is there a limit to how many SPACs we can have? I think I think it's not going to grow in the same way that this this thing has you know blossomed you know so far, uh, as as I, as I as I was kind of alluding to earlier. I think the thing with SPACs now it's going to be quality, not quantity, uh, because you will increasingly get to a point where investors are more selective. It's going to be about the robustness of the management te management teams, uh, the 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 strength of the sponsor. It's going to be around. Their proven track record, as I said, this ability to despac and despac well is going to be key because that's really where you know what defines the success of a spac. Otherwise, many of the folks who have done spacs who are not able to to despac effectively will just end up having to give their money back. So I think you will see a flight to quality in spacs, and and the uh, and the the deals that you see coming are going to be increasingly going to be, um, you know, investors are going to be more selective and you're going to see the strongest and the ablest management teams get done. One theme, though, is this, uh, you know, what has been so far predominantly a U.S. phenomena is now hitting uh, EMEA in a fantastic way. So, you know, uh, really fasten your seatbelts because uh, this move is coming to, the, uh, to this region and, uh, and we are seeing a yeah. lot of inbounds from very high quality folks wanting to raise packs. Um, Viz, we only have a minute left. I wanted to ask you whether you're planning to move any more assets or peoples in Europe because of Brexit. Look, we, we've done the move. So we've been ready for Brexit for you know the best part of uh, four years. And all the asset moves that we had to do to be functional from day one, you know, those have happened. We now watch with bated breath as to how equivalence looks and you know where we end up on financial services. But But we are ready. We are serving clients. I mean, it's seamless. But now the next steps are really going to be driven by you know, what the uh, equivalence looks like and what where we land on uh, financial services right now. Viz, thank you so much. I know you're a busy man, but next time we need you on, well, on air with me, possibly here in the studio for two hours, because we also need to talk about ESG. I know one of the big themes that the Chief Executive Officer uh, Forum for J.P. Morgan, Viz Ragan, Ragavan there, J.P. Morgan EMEA Chief Executive Officer. Now, Smart Conversations on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Later on in the show, we'll also speak exclusively to the Chief Executive of one of the world's biggest alcohol drink makers, Ivan Menezes of Diageo. Before then, we'll have a chat, though, with Francesco Starace from Enel, and that's an ESG conversation. This is Bloomberg.
I'm David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. It's really a reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Zero, the edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, this is what we're looking at pre market. Now, yesterday it was all about NASDAQ. It was down, then it was up. And actually, yesterday, Tesla, for example, rose 20%, which added an extra $25 billion to Elon Musk. Now, this is what we're seeing pre market. So, pretty much flat for Tesla, but actually, GameStop, stop rather, GameStop, some people would say, gaining 13%. Coming up, a conversation on ESG with the NL chief executive. This is Bloomberg. BSO Now is your online home for brand new Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. Discover new releases each week that include behind-the-scenes storytelling with conductors including music director Andres Nelsons, guest composers and musicians, plus critically acclaimed archival concerts and more. Visit bso.org forward slash now where the music plays on. BSO Season sponsored by Bank of America. CPG history, their experience, and really how we might be able to um, uh, combine together to really create this fantastic public company. And so uh, we kind of got into this back thing a little bit before it became such a hot method of going public. Every Friday with 30 minutes dedicated to fixed income, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Bounce back. Tesla leads the resurgence in high valuation stocks overnight, driving the Nasdaq to its biggest advance since last November. But can it maintain momentum? The big breach, Silicon Valley, suffers its second cyber attack in almost as many days. Hackers gain access to 150,000 live surveillance cameras in hospitals, prisons, and also Tesla's offices. And two exciting conversations. Well, Ivan Menaces of Diageo joins us exclusively, and Francesco Starace of Enel joins us next. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, everyone. This is the early edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. 
European Council President Charles Michel is accusing the UK of blocking export of COVID-19 vaccines, saying he is shocked, but has drawn a sharp rebuke from the British government, who are vehemently denying the move. Bloomberg sources tell us Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has written a letter to the EU saying the claim is completely false. Now, the airline sector says most governments are moving too slowly in setting out a roadmap for a return to air travel. Industry group IATA says Britain has detailed plans, but more countries need to act. It thinks by the end of the year, air travel will be about half the level of 2019. The virtual tools is our strong competitor to, uh, uh, to travel, but they will not replace travel. For the business travel, it will come back but probably 12 to 18 months later and after the, uh, the personal um, uh, motivation for, for, uh, for air travel. And Russia is planning to slow access to Twitter. That's after announcing a lawsuit against it for not deleting posts about last month's protests over the jailing of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Russia didn't directly mention the demonstrations in the new order, saying the move is because the social network failed to remove content unsafe for teenagers. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Watch. Now, Europe's biggest utility, NL, has signed a $12 billion loan, the largest ever tied to climate goals. The deal beats, beats beer giant AB InBev's record last month, and this is NL's second milestone in sustainable debt. Now, the Italian utility was the first issuer to actually sell bonds which, with terms tied to sustainability goals. Well, we're delighted to be joined by NL chief executive Francesco Starace, who is participating in JP Morgan's virtual CEO forum today. So, Francesco Starace, thank you so much, as always, for joining us on Bloomberg Surveillance. When you look at the amount of work that you've done in issuing bronze, and I remember actually it was about 18 months ago that we first started talking about it, I believe, in on, on the riverbanks of Lake Como. Um, how much more is this now mainstream? How many more of your rivals are you expecting to come in and actually try and issue some of these bonds linked to sustainability? We saw this, uh, this coming uh, at that time. I remember it was uh, <laughs> at the beginning of this uh, strange year, 2020, but we, uh, we expected many more companies to follow suit because this, this is a very interesting financial uh, uh, instrumentation that is now being deployed. Uh, and we see that happening. We've, uh, we've seen companies uh, getting through this, although 2020 was not really an ideal moment for this kind of innovation to take place. But um, we are very, very happy to see that we have companies all over the world uh, from luxury goods to um, uh, pharmaceutical to, to uh, food agro-food agro industries, uh, picking up the the, the challenge of um, you know inventing new uh, combination between the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and financial instruments. So the game is now choose your target and tie it to uh, a commitment, and then go out in the market and uh, and ask for money to to sustain that effort. It works, um, and we've seen this uh, becoming now quite kind of a very important uh, new financial uh, dimension. Have you actually considered adding new sustainability targets to some of your financing? So it be it more social, being uh, you know uh, complied more on governance, or even women on boards. I think we have, uh, you know, the, the SDG recommendation is that a company that focuses on more than three and four of the SDGs uh, lacks of focus. So we have four SDGs as main uh, main goals, and they are the number seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and they all have to do with our activity. Basically, we will link most of our activities and most of our commitments to decarbonization, renewable growth, and also uh, life in cities. So I think the next waves will, will have to do with improvement of living conditions in large metropolitan areas. Um, I think the S dimension will come into focus probably a year from now, because we need to first get through this in a method in a let's say, uh, methodical fashion, and we cannot jump from one thing to the other. But 
we have for for these commitments more um, directly uh, linked uh, tools to the uh, remuneration of management. So we have that into the management remuneration, not yet into the commitment on the on the loans and on the bond uh, community. That typically takes place a year or two afterwards. But what will you actually do with the savings from the sustainable linked loans when interest rates get reduced when you meet your ESG targets? They simply go into the into lowering our financial costs. So they, they will make our company more competitive and more able to continue and accelerate on the sustainable path. So it, it's a it's a it's a company wide effort. They don't go into single projects. Right. Do you see, because of the recovery fund, because there's a new prime minister in Italy, um, a lot more tension on ESG? And how helpful is that as you try and achieve some of those goals? I think it's really helpful. Um, and, and, you know, to look at it from an Italian perspective, Italy is quite a sustainable uh, economy in its own. Uh, it's one of those that has uh, less energy input per unit of GDP. It's quite an efficient system. And it is also a very circular economy under many points of view. The points uh, that I just outlined are not fully understood by the Italian economy in itself. So it, it's like we are unconscious of this. So if we get to put our arms around how sustainable we have already become and how can we progress, then I think Italy can benefit from a lower cost of debt too. In fact, um, I think we've seen the Treasury emitting the first ever green bond, which is, you know, the first really tiny step in that dimension uh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. So it seems that they finally um, are getting into that uh, that line of thinking. And I, I, I really think it should be done at Italian level and also at European level. Um, Francesco, given we have a new Biden administration, so a new administration in the White House, given it's COP26 and so there's going to be maybe a lot more efforts, is now the year where we're going to see much more green bond issuance overall from European companies? I think there will be a continued issuance of green bonds. And I remember green bonds are project-linked instrumentation. So they are a bit cumbersome to manage, and they are not necessarily an index of the company becoming sustainable. They just need, they just indicate that, that a certain initiative of the company goes in that direction, but not the company as a whole. Uh, I think that will continue, and that trend will still be there for a long, long time. But it will be, let's say, in parallel to that, you will see the growth of holistic, sustainable tools that do not target a single initiative or a single project, but the company as a whole. So how to make the company more sustainable and not just a single initiative of the company. Uh, you know, I can be a very unsustainable company, but still put a solar roof on my factory, and that qualifies for a green bond, but it doesn't indicate that I am particularly sustainable. Francesco, thank you so much for all the insight. Francesco Staraccia there, the NL Chief Executive, of course, doing a lot of good in the sustainability space. And so we'll uh, catch up with Francesco very soon to see if there's any more updates on some of those financing. Now, Diageo has been ranked the number one business in the UK for female representation. Up next, we speak exclusively to the Chief Executive of one of the world's largest alcoholic drink makers, Ivan Menezes. And you, if you have any questions for him, you can just IB plus TV go. This is Bloomberg. face-to-face -face learning is the ideal, but I don't think that we are ever going quite back to that. What we're seeing is more of this integration of the technology into the day-to-day. -day. We have seen that schools have had this kind of 
of trial by fire in terms of trying to reopen successfully, and that many schools have had to use a system of using different ideas around what it would take to reopen and then pivoting when those ideas did not work well, meaning that some have had to go back and had to close. Uh, and that's been a global challenge. I'm going. But there is a tipping point. The business team you love to watch. Weekday mornings on Bloomberg Television. The inequality of the current world environment. It's troubling, and I think it's, uh, it's actually getting worse, which is a big challenge. World Bank president there, David Malpass, is speaking to Bloomberg a little bit earlier on. Now let's talk about equality with our next exclusive conversation. Uh, Diageo has been ranked as number one business in the UK for female representation. That's according to this year's Hampton Alexander Review. Now the maker of Guinness and Johnny Walker has surpassed the review's index with 60% women on its board and 37% women in leadership roles. Well, joining us now is Ivan Menezes. He is the Diageo chief executive officer. Ivan, first of all, congratulations on those figures and really trying to spearhead um, a world where it, it, there's more gender equality and more diversity in general. What have you learned in going through the process that would be precious advice for others? Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd say inclusion and diversity is at the heart of our company. It's in our purpose, our values, and integrated into our strategy. And the business benefits are enormous. Obviously, the society benefits are enormous. But my view is this makes a better business. And diversity in all its forms, we're talking about gender today, but we've also set aggressive goals on ethnicity. Uh, in 2030, we've committed to getting 45% of our senior leadership uh, teams to be ethnically diverse and parity on gender. And uh, it leads to better decisions. It leads to better performance. And at the end of the day, a consumer business like ours, if we don't reflect our marketplace, we will not be yeah. fulfilling our top tier potential. But Ivan, d d has it made also for a more interesting or easier conversation with shareholders? Is it something that shareholders you think overall will demand more of companies? Uh, yes, and it is moving on all ESG dimensions, but I do think uh, diversity uh, Okay, guys, I'm going to place a stop on profit for Bitcoin. The price I'm looking to sell if it change, uh, the price will change direction, 54,739. 54,739. It will give us half a percent of profit from whatever, uh, for you, for us, it will give us 500 pounds in profit. For you, whatever broker pays you, what kind of margin you have, and or how much contracts, how many contracts, or how many Bitcoins you hold. Okay? So the, so placed, and nothing can change. So if it will change direction, it will be filled, executed at price 54,739. It, it will give us 0.5%, half a percent in profit. Stay safe. ...dispute, which was the cause of these tariffs. So uh, a business like ours uh, uh, is a global uh, business. We require conditions for free and fair trade. 
And uh, uh, I do believe, and I'm optimistic, that uh, we've uh, well positioned now for our whiskey business to do better. The UK coming out of Brexit with its independent trade uh, strategy now has the opportunity to strike deals uh, with many markets around the world, which could be favorable for us. So uh, uh, having a, an orderly, free uh, global trading order is very good for the whiskey business. Do, do you see bars or people restocking from the U.S., Ivan, or are you expecting actually that to happen when things reopen a little bit? So you know, how much it was at tariffs and how much it was a pandemic and bars closed? Well, I'd say the U.S. trends across spirits has been very strong. And in our results, our spirits business in the last half in the United States grew 15 percent. And uh, it is not just whiskey. Our tequila business, uh, Don Julio and Casamigos, growing at very high growth rates. Uh, a brand like Bailey's grew double digit, Bullet Bourbon, uh, Ciroc Vodka. The trend towards drinking better has accelerated through this pandemic. People are moving to more premium brands. And spirits is gaining share from beer and wine. So what we're seeing both in the at-home occasion and as the recovery happens, as bars and restaurants open, uh, the human desire to socialize and uh, celebrate in and outside the home is very, very strong. And our business as a result is coming through stronger. We're gaining market share in most parts of the world. And uh, uh, we're benefiting from uh, people drinking better because we have a very premium portfolio and that's growing the fastest in our business. Ivan, are there any M&A gems out there that have been thrown up because of the pandemic? Are, are you targeting anything that now looks a, a lot cheaper because actually bars were closed and so valuations came down? Uh, well, through this uh, last 12 months, uh, we've stayed invested in the business on our marketing, on our capital spending, and on M&A. We've done three deals, uh, aviation uh, gin in the United States, that was $600 million. We bought Chase gin in, in the United Kingdom. And just uh, this week, we've announced uh, uh, a ranch water, which is an agave-based seltzer uh, business that we bought in the United States, uh, uh, Lone River Ranch Water, which we're very excited about. So there are opportunities. We want uh, brands that have uh, a good runway for profitable growth. And uh, we're very much on the hunt to find attractive brands to add to the portfolio. When are you expecting things to reopen, Ivan? I mean, I know it's been so difficult for a, a lot of bars, restaurants, the hospitality industry, and therefore also Diageo. Are you expecting you know, that these vaccines work and that will be almost fully reopened by the summer in the UK and elsewhere? Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, we do see light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, what I would say is in many parts of the world, actually, our business is, is fully back. The United States and China is growing very fast ahead of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, where, where half our business is out of home, uh, linked to bars and pubs and restaurants, uh, we're confident that that business will come back. So my expectation is from here on, we will see steady improvement. And in the, in the six months of results we announced ending December, Diageo was already ahead of our pre-pandemic levels. So the business has really the resilience, it's got momentum, and uh, uh, our marketing uh, has been ex very creative in terms of connecting with consumers as they go through uh, uh, this difficult period. And so we've benefited because we've had very good market share gains uh, yeah. around the world. Ivan, you know what my 25-year-old producer is asking me? You know, how many of your drinks are going to be alcohol-free in the future? This is how the pandemic and, like, healthy eating, you know, it has changed the world. Is that going to be the, the bigger trend over the next four to five years? Less alcohol? Uh, I'd say there's uh, two trends. One is... Uh, uh, people drinking better, so those that drink alcohol are going to move to more premium brands, and we benefit from that. You know, Diageo has only 5% of the dollars in the world's drinks, so there's an there's a enormous opportunity to grow there. But then to your point, we do see lower and no alcohol product offerings being uh, uh, an attractive additional growth opportunity. We've recently launched... Uh, Tanqueray 0.0 and Gordon 0.0 uh, in the UK market. It's doing very well. Uh, we acquired yeah. the Seedlip brand. 
So there's good growth there, but it's it's for occasions. It's what do you drink when you don't want to drink <laughs> on certain certain evenings when you go out, and we will have an offer for that as well. Yeah, we'll save that for the for the non homeschooling days. Ivan, thank you, Ivan Menezes, there at the Diageo Chief Executive Officer. Now coming up, hospitals, jails, and car maker Tesla are all, all amongst the victims of a massive hack, the latest breach to plague the cybersecurity world. We have the full details next. This is Bloomberg. leaders were actually better at controlling the deaths from COVID-19. Do you think out of this pandemic, we'll see more countries be willing to elect female leaders? When we look at women leaders, we tend to project on them baggage that they shouldn't bear. Women are given an opportunity when no one else wants to do the job. Women have a very clear objective. Uh, they wanted to save lives. The women leaders if you look at their careers, have also built up a level of, of trust. In fact, women have to be better at communication in order to be elected uh, as leaders, whereas this doesn't hold true for men. We need to get those sexist stereotypes out of our head and give women a fair run for leadership. Trying to change the stereotypes about women is not only the business of women, but men have to be part of it. that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance here in the edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Silicon Valley has suffered its second massive cyber attack in almost as many days. A group of hackers say they've been breached a massive trove of security camera data managed by startup Verkada, gaining access to live feeds of surveillance cameras inside hospitals, jails. Car maker Tesla is amongst one of them. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg cybersecurity reporter Jer uh, Jamie a Terabyte. Jamie, this is incredible. Who exactly is responsible for this and what is Verkada doing about it? Well, the people that are behind it describe themselves as an international hacker collective. And they say one of the reasons that they did this was because they wanted to show, you know, just how easy it is to break into these systems, uh, the pervasiveness of surveillance systems, and also just, you know, sort of highlighting the intrusions uh, that, that go on in a lot of these places. Some of the camera footage that they had access to were inside hospitals. They were able to see uh, people, employees, pinning a 
man to a bed. They were able to look into police stations and watch people getting interrogated. Uh, and they did it so easily, too. They were able to find the administrator account, uh, sort of the credentials, the username and the password, uh, just publicly available online. And just being able to sort of show people what is possible with their data has been something that Verkata is really sort of scrambling to try to address right now. They, uh, they have basically said that they have shut down all the internal admin accounts. They're launching an investigation to address the size and the scope yep. of the hack. And uh, they've also set up a line, a support line, to sort of talk to customers and walk them through what they can and cannot do to, so to address it. Jamie, what, yeah, so what questions does this actually raise about cybersecurity in Silicon Valley? I think one of the questions that this highlights, really, and it, we've seen it before, we saw it not too not too long ago with you know sort of the, the, the clubhouse breaches. When you have something that's new and amazing and uh, does very very well, when it becomes when it gets valued and you know sort of the, the rounds of venture sort of capital that go into it, uh, that not whether there's a lot of thought that goes into the privacy end of it, whether there's a lot of thought that goes into securing the security for the customers when they're making a product. And I think that, you know, this is a very good example of what happens when they're not really paying attention to those details, which may not appear critical to them, but are very much so for, for everyone else. Just an outstanding story. Thank you so much, our Bloomberg security reporter there, Jamie Tarabay, joining us. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition, continues up next. We'll start soon delivering also COVID-19 vaccines once all permissions have been granted. We are in discussion with Ministry of Health, with current logistic partners uh, in different countries. So we're looking at Southeast Asia right now on delivering COVID-19 vaccines. We are also setting up already on the African continent in, uh, in already one country and looking at the second country to expand. never sleep. So stay connected with Francine Lacqua in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, and Kaylee Lines in New York. Perspective on the day ahead. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Weekday mornings on Bloomberg Television. Trading revenue is coming in better than expected. Everything cash, $1.4 trillion of cash. One of the most notable aspects of this report that was stellar. which has changed compared with December is the 1.9 trillion 
U.S. stimulus that will lift and global GDP growth by about a full percentage point. Emerging markets are going to benefit from that. China, India. The risk of doing too little to help American families outweighed the risk of doing too much. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. Well, good morning from London, Berlin, and New York. On this Wednesday, March the 10th, our top stories today. The big boost, the House is set to send that $1.9 trillion stimulus bill to President Biden for his signature. It's one of the largest economic relief packages in U.S. history. Bounce back, Tesla leads the resurgence in high valuation stocks overnight, driving the Nasdaq to its biggest advance since last November. But can, the main t can, can it maintain momentum? And the big breach, Silicon Valley suffers its second cyber attack in almost as many days. Hackers gain access to 150,000 live surveillance cameras in hospitals, prisons, and even Tesla's offices. Now we have uh, quite a lot going on, Matt. I, I actually cannot believe uh, this uh, hacking story. I know we had a reporter, we'll speak to Alex Webb on it shortly as well. I mean, it's absolutely chilling to think what they had access to, and that kind of ties back to some of the biggest risks for the year ahead. Yeah, I mean, having seen all of the Bourne Identity uh, movies, including those <laughs> after... Um, after Matt Damon left, which I also thought were really good, I knew that hackers could get into yeah, yeah. video surveillance cameras. Hackers can get into everything, and apparently this hacker is one of the best in the world. So you've got to assume that that's possible. What I think is interesting is that one company is operating so many cameras, right? I think 150,000, yeah. yeah. that seems like a lot. I would operate my own video surveillance network. I should, you know, we should have also predicted the pandemic just because of contagion, Matt. You're absolutely right. We need to be more on top of these Hollywood blockbusters also and what Matt they tell Damon. us about the future of the world. Also Matt Damon. He's, you know, they're also a Matt. Matt, there's something going on. Let's get to the market. I don't know if there's a Matt in the markets, Kaylee, <laughs> you know, apart from our own Matt Miller. Maybe Matt Damon should play Matt Miller in his biotech biopic. I think that may be my favorite <laughs> casting candidate. But in the markets, we do, of course, have to pay attention to what's going on. Maybe not as many fireworks as we saw yesterday. Right now, the moves are pretty marginal, both in Europe and when it comes to U.S. futures. Right now, the NASDAQ 100 futures only up about a tenth of 1%. But, of course, that is after a monster comeback rally yesterday, the best day for the index since November, a very stark reversal of the rotation. The question is, does that stick today, or was it just some dip buying after deeply the index plunged to deeply oversold levels. Of course, the equity market's taking a lot of its cues from the bond market. Right now, the 10-year yield inching back up about three basis points, sitting at 1.55% ahead of a $38 billion Treasury auction later today. And the dollar giving back some of its earlier strength, sitting right now just shy of 92 on the dollar spot index. As for some of those technology movers that had outsized gains yesterday, a check on what they're doing in the pre-market. ARK Investment, Man uh, Investment Management, Kathy Woods Fund, its basic uh, flagship fund, ARK Innovation, had its best day ever yesterday. It's up another nine-tenths of a percent in the pre-market. Tesla, 20% gain in the Tuesday session. It is also higher before the bell. Apple, though, is fractionally lower, so it looks like it could be a mixed day for big tech. We will pay attention to what those heavyweight names do come the opening bell in about four and a half hours' time. As for what else we're watching today, an important read on inflation is coming up at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. February CPI data will be very closely watched at 10.30 we get the EIA crude oil inventories report. And then, of course, at 1 p.m., that $38 billion 10-year auction from the Treasury. What will demand look like? It was pretty solid for the three-year yesterday. And then on t all day today, we are watching Capitol Hill for the House voting on that $1.9 trillion stimulus package, Matt. So I, um, I think it's interesting to watch yields and those tech stocks. I did see on Joe Weisenthal's Twitter this morning that Tesla is up in the pre-market already. But you see yields there uh, up, as you showed, Kaylee, as well. This chart, I think, shows a great inverse correlation. And we've seen um, that sink to the biggest since 2016. We talked about it on this program before. But here in white, you see the NASDAQ 100. And in blue, you see the 10-year yield. Um, if you see the yield continue to rise, maybe you see the tech stocks continue to fall Tesla notwithstanding. So I think it's an interesting thing, uh, relationship, really, to keep your eye on. Francine? 
Yeah, Matt, I think Tesla pre-market was up 1% and then it, it fell slightly. Hackers say they gained access to 150,000 surveillance cameras inside hospitals, companies, police departments, and even schools. Now, among those whose footage was exposed, the car maker Tesla and software provider Cloudflare. Now, to make sense of all of this, our Bloomberg Opinion Tech columnist Alex Webb joins us. Alex, I mean, this is huge and frankly terrifying. First of all, how, you know, how is it possible that a collective of hackers can hack 150,000 live feeds? Well, the details that are outlined in, in William Turton's story, which I recommend everybody reads, is, it's really good, um, suggests that the hackers actually found uh, administrator sign-in privileges on the open web. They found it online, which makes it sound a lot like it's, it's human error, that ultimately you can have the most secure systems in the world, but if somebody <laughs> exposes their password, it's quite easy to get in. Don't know if that there was dual-factor authentication, for instance, that might have made things a little bit more difficult. And then, yes, that second point, it points towards, you know, the concentration of access in, you know, not many hands. Uh, it, it, the ability through one account to see a huge number of accounts, you know, echoes of the... Um, of the Edward Snowden affair, where huge numbers of uh, US contractors were able to access a lot of data, which was quite sensitive. And so it does raise questions inevitably about some of the security practices at, at this company. But if this is a company which ultimately is in the cybersecurity business to an extent, certainly in the security business, you know, there are questions about every company in the world. And actually, we do have to be on top of, of our most basic procedures Alex to ensure the stuff doesn't get exposed. I want to first. I want to say I absolutely love the look. I'm not sure if Robert Downey Jr. would play you. Well, I think Robert Downey Jr. But the hair is very McConaughey. Um, do you think that there will be any kind of regulatory backlash to this? I mean, my first thought was to watch these stocks today to see if um, they fall on that kind of concern. I think it's probably far too early to tell or something like this. I think there's been a drip, drip, you know, probably a bit more accelerated than that of news this year about um, sizable hacks that are that are happening. Um, I think the cybersecurity is kind of looking at itself and going, well, what can we do as an industry? It tends to be quite fragmented. You know, it's hard as a company to go and say, I'm going to get a, a turnkey solution which makes everything secure. You quite often have to go to a bunch of different players. Some companies are then looking at, well, do we do a roll-up and try to have a more comprehensive offering from a business perspective? That's harder to achieve because you're not sure what the synergies are beyond on the sales side. So there's a lot of moving parts here which make it not an easy problem to solve. And from a regulatory perspective, uh, you, you know, there isn't an immediately obvious solution. This is stuff that companies should really be doing for their own benefit, not because they need a regulator to tell them to. Yeah, I mean, I wonder whether lawsuits are in the working or not. Alex, thanks so much. Alex Webb there of Bloomberg Opinion, looking at all things at tech. Now, coming up next, we talk inflation. Of course, the main obsession of the markets over the last couple of weeks. We're joined by Paul Donovan. He's UBS Wealth Management Global Chief Economist. And then a little bit later today, Richard Haas, Council on Foreign Relations President. That's at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg.
in the beginning of 2021, what are your biggest worries? The inequality of the current world environment. It's troubling, and I think it's, uh, it's actually getting worse, which is a big challenge. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacquin, London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, it's one of the largest economic relief packages in U.S. history. The House is set to give final approval to President Biden's $1.9 trillion package. Now, it's likely to become law without getting a single Republican vote in the House or the Senate. Well, we're joined by Paul Donovan, UBS Global Wealth Management Chief Economist. Uh, Paul, I mean, the fixation on the markets is basically whether the inflation story that we've seen play out in Treasuries, that we've seen play out in dollar, and of course, in, in tech stocks, is real. You have questions, but is this the markets versus economists? Actually, I, I think it's probably Republicans versus Democrats, as so much is in the United States these days, that if you support uh, uh, President Biden's fiscal package, then you're going to say, well, that's because there's deflation forces in the economy and, and we need to reflate. And if you don't support President Biden's package, you're going to say, no, the economy is doing fine and this is just adding unnecessary gasoline to the, to the fire. So I think this has become uh, quite a partisan issue overall rather than sort of uh, economists versus markets, because we all know economists will win in that fight. Uh, of course they will. But if you look at the cost pressures at some point, Paul, I mean, you know, at, at what point does the Fed say this is there's too much inflation for me not to do anything, you know, uh, despite you always being right, of course? Well, we know the second quarter is going to get an inflation spike, and we know the Fed's going to ignore it because it's all about oil price base effects. Nobody was, was paying the low price for oil last year. That's why the oil price was so low. So you know, the consumer doesn't really feel that either. What, of course, we've had is a surge in demand for manufactured product globally over the last six months, this shift away from services and towards goods in terms of consumer spending. But because... Uh, manufactured product is part of very long, very complicated supply chains. You have had um, squeezes and disruption in those supply chains, and it has led to cost pressures. But the thing is, later this year, we're going to see a shift back to service sector spending. Service sector supply chains, short, simple, based on labor. What have we got an absolute abundance of unemployed labor at the moment. That's what the Fed keeps saying, that, that surplus capacity, the 10 million Americans who don't have jobs today, who did have jobs a year ago, that's going to keep down that inflation pressure when we go back to service sector spending. Well, I wonder also, Paul, on, on the manufacturing side, I mean, you make a point that, put very simply, is we're all going to start buying stuff as soon as we get our stimmies, right? Um, but we're also all going to start selling stuff. Is the capacity there, uh, is the bounce back um, foreseeable in manufacturing as well? Well, that's a, a very interesting question. So we've had two uh, issues here. U.S. manufacturing has not really bounced back in the way that Asian manufacturing or European manufacturing has. Um, so global manufacturing has basically fully recovered from the pandemic, but the U.S. has lagged behind in that. And I think as we see restrictions continue to ease, that capacity is likely to, to pick up. It does depend, of course, on the virus remaining contained, um, but the capacity there can pick up. But the other thing, and this still isn't being talked about enough, is this absolute surge in new business startups that we've seen US, UK, Germany, France. I mean, the, the, the growth in business startups is absolutely exceptional. And a lot of that business is service sector. A lot of it is around transport and, and retail and so on. But some of that will be manufacturing. Uh, and with that, again, we've got an, an unknown impact on capacity and, of course, an unknown impact on competition because there are more firms competing uh, for your stimulus check. I, you know, on the manufacturing side, there's been a lot of constraint um, due to the commodities uh, price increase, but also shortages in supply chains you mentioned. 
Um, I think of automotive. You know, I ordered a new BMW R9T earlier this month. It's not going to be ready until May or even June. Um, and you can see that across Ford has issues delivering um, uh, Broncos. Uh, Volkswagen has issues. FCA has issues. Um, when are these supply chain constraints going to loosen up? We talked yesterday to the CEO of Continental. They can't make tires fast enough. Um, well, but the problem is the cars just aren't being produced. Well, you've got, uh, as I said, with these long, complex supply chains, this is the problem. Are we going to suddenly resolve long, complex supply chains overnight? No, it's going to take years, three, four, five years before you start seeing more localization of production. But the kinks in the supply chain will iron out. You know, we've got Asia producing now at uh, above pre-pandemic levels. We've got most of Europe producing at above pre-pandemic levels. Now, we've been running down inventory. We've had a, an, an exceptional surge in demand for goods. That sort of led to an imbalance. But it will resolve itself. This doesn't last forever. And, of course, that means that companies have got to think, um, do we just ask our customers to be patient? Difficult in the United States, I know, but possible. Or do we raise prices? And I think what we will see is simply a number of companies saying, look, yes, yeah, you're not going to get your car until May, but you will get your car in May, and we're not going to necessarily change the price because of that. So companies taking the longer-term view may say this is a temporary supply chain disruption. We're not going to raise prices on the back of it. We're going to maintain customer loyalty to the brand instead. Paul, I want to look ahead to tomorrow in the ECB decision. Policymakers in Europe have talked a lot of talk about reigning in the bond market if necessary, but they haven't actually acted yet. What are you expecting to hear from Christine Lagarde tomorrow? Do you think that the ECB needs to make a move? I mean, to be honest, I don't think we're at alarming bond yield levels. But then, you know, I remember 1994, and, and you know, this is barely a blip in comparison to you know, a proper bond market sell-off. Um, I think that the, the, the central policy of the ECB will be masterful inactivity. Uh, they're very good at, at inactivity. They do it a lot. So I think that's going to be the central thrust. And then we will get some well-meaning words uh, around the bond market uh, from you know, uh, ECB President Lagarde or, or uh, other council members. Um, we get that with the currency as well. And I think we're in that sort of situation where the ECB has uh, a moderate degree of discomfort with some of the recent developments, as it sometimes has with the currency. You'll get some rhetoric coming out, and they hope that that calms things down. It doesn't often achieve that, but that, I think, is going to be the first stage response. Well, I mean, Mario Draghi achieved it with whatever it takes, uh, Paul. Does the Fed do the same, or do, do we actually need to see an ECB take a little bit more action? Uh, I think that the, 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 the problem that you've got here is that We've got a, a global bond market that is adjusting to the fact that the world economy is continually beating expectations. And let's not lose sight of that. I mean, the, you know, the economic outperformance over the last six months, you know, the, the, the surprise indices are sort of permanently pointing upwards. Data revisions are permanently pointing upwards. You barely ever get a German release without it being revised positively the following month. So we're seeing a lot of, of good news. And that's reflected in global bond prices. Um, and there is a limit to what a single central bank, uh, particularly the ECB, can do to influence global bond prices. Um, I think that they can make sure that we don't get disorderly markets. I think the Fed is going to do that. I would be surprised if we were to see aggressive action at this stage after what is, after all, an economically insignificant move in bond yields. Paul, thanks so much. Paul Donovan there of UBS Global Wealth Management. Matt, I love the way that you, you always talk about uh, cars. And if you look at, you know, some of the uh, supply chain yeah. problems in terms of chips, I don't know whether it makes it more difficult to access some of the cars. Are you into cars or are, are we <laughs> buying a new kind of, you know, a motorbike? It, well, no, uh, both of those things, but it's a good point. Um, the chip shortage is something the Biden administration is working on, but I think it's interesting. Paul said those supply chains could take years to bounce back. The price, he pointed out, stays the same from the manufacturer, but I've seen just this morning a Ford uh, Mach-E, just the base model of their new electric uh, SUV going for 10000 over M MSRP, and I know a dealer in Columbus yeah. who sold a Ram TRX for 20000 over MSRP. So when they get to the dealerships, the markups are high. 
Matt, I want to know how many of those stimulus checks actually go into buying either new cars or partially funding maybe a new motorbike. That's kind of the question of the day for me. And we also found out that Joe Biden is not signing the stimulus checks, unlike his predecessor. Now, later today, we also speak with the NYSC president, Stacey Cunningham. That interview, 11.30 a.m. in New York, 4.30 p.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg. of the world's trade travels by sea. At any given time, around 5,000 ships are on the ocean carry containers. Without them, the global economy would collapse. Many of those containers pass through here, Singapore, the world's second largest port. The industry accounts for 7% of the country's GDP. But the industry is under pressure. The uneven recovery from the pandemic is creating a shortage of containers where they're needed most and driving bottlenecks at major ports. It sent freight prices soaring. Since the beginning of COVID-19, these are levels of shipments that we've never seen before. Chinese New Year marks a seasonal turn for freighters when rates are renegotiated for the next year. Companies must choose whether to swallow the financial hit pass on the cost. It's a decision that could bring new headwinds of a global economic recovery. It's such an interesting new world. The world is changing. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. While well, everyone is zigging, we're zagging. We feel like we can maybe help people out more. We have an enormous number of big ideas. Right now, about half of U.S. households invest. We like to get that number up to 95 plus percent. It should just be something that people do. is not a fad that we are using it in all aspects of our lives for work, for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. It's really a reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the UN, we did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Francine Lacqua in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Let's get you your first word news top stories from the Bloomberg terminal. In China, producer prices rose last month at the fastest pace in more than two years. That adds to the risk of global inflation. The Chinese producer price index was up 1.7 percent from a year earlier. That raises the prospect that China could start exporting inflation, a big concern for Francine, as factories raise prices for products <laughs> sold abroad. It was a record day for one of the richest people in the world. Elon Musk made $25 billion yesterday. Musk's electric car maker Tesla rose 20%. That pushed his fortune to $174 billion, less than $6 billion short of the man at the top. 
Jeff Bezos. Deutsche Bank is being criticized by its own employees for giving other employees higher bonuses. Workers at the bank's call center subsidiary have been on strike for five weeks over demand for higher pay. One employee says, quote, there's enough money for investment bankers, but not for us. Deutsche Bank increased its bonus pool this year. The biggest share will go to traders, whose performance led to the bank's first profit in six years. Now, I thought this was a really interesting story, and it's a problem that's been brewing for Deutsche Bank for a while. But the question is, um, does getting a marginally better trader make you more money than getting a marginally better call center employee? And when I was thinking about this, I was reminded of Trading Places. I'm sure you've both seen the classic Wall Street film in which they pick Billy Ray Valentine off the street yeah. and he turns into an Matt, excellent trader. Eddie Murphy, of course. Yeah, but if I want to be a good customer, I want to be, you know, pleased with service, the, the, the person who takes my call is extremely important to me. The trader that makes money for the bank a little bit less. So if you're client focused, I would go for increasing the salary of uh, the person on the call center. Yeah, I wonder if that's the question, not that people working in the investment bank should make any less, but maybe you need to pay the people working in the call center a little bit more. Free money for all. Stimulus checks, right? <laughs> that's what the U.S. is doing. Let's do it for bankers as well. Coming up next, we'll talk about banking with Octavio Marenzi, Opemus chief executive. This is Bloomberg. COVID, but um, just it, it's COVID related, but it's also stress related to job. I think COVID probably just sort of was the nail in the coffin for, for a lot of us. destruction room here is also a very healthy outlet. I do not encourage it as something that we do on a regular basis, um, but I do find that when people come in, being able to break plates, being able to write out, I, uh, out whatever's on their mind and letting it go, being able to just take out their frustration and their anger. <laughs> a place like this and be able to break some stuff and release some tension without going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> PSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit pso.org slash now, where the music plays on. PSO season sponsor, Bank of America. Every Friday with 30 minutes dedicated to fixed income, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. This is 
Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Francine Lacqua in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, and Kaylee Lyons in New York. Now, there's quite a lot going on in the markets. I know we talk about inflation. That's definitely been dominated market moves. But, Matt, I'm really interested in your BioNTech chief executive interview. You spoke to him yesterday, and there's definitely the spat between the UK and the EU. And it's just, it's not not only going away, it's just getting worse. Right. Although BioNTech has been actually quite good at delivering um, shots to Germany. AstraZeneca is the problem that Ursula von der Leyen um, uh, has raised. And of course, G the Germans don't have a great track record with AstraZeneca either. There was a point when um, the Chancellor Angela Merkel said, well, she's not in the age group, so she wouldn't be taking the AZN shot. Now it's been cleared, so I'm sure she probably would. The weird thing, I think, is that here in Germany, the Chancellor doesn't get the shot first. Mm. They want to be just like right. regular people, right? But in the U.S., I, the president gets it right away. You don't lose your president. Right, but Matt, I mean, what I, you know, as a U.K. Um, citizen, you, you kind of find it crazy that people have any, you know, can say, well, I want this shot and not shot, because actually if you look at all shots, it significantly decreases your chances of dying or ending up in hospital. So I would just take anything. And Kaylee, this, of course, filter, I know we talk about inflation, but the reopening of vaccines also always is essential in market movement. Oh, absolutely, Francine. And that is what has fueled that furious rotation in large part toward the reopening trade, more cyclically sensitive areas of the market. That, of course, took a massive pause yesterday with the 4% rally in the NASDAQ 100. But it looks like that rotation may pick up some steam again today. Looking at the futures market, it is Russell 2000 futures that are outperforming up around three tenths of 1% right now. We're only up about a tenth of 1% on the NASDAQ 100. So we will see if there is any kind of follow through buying from yesterday's rally or if it was just the market bouncing off some technically very oversold levels. Of course, keep a close eye on the bond market, especially come 1 p.m. Eastern time when $38 billion worth of 10-year treasuries will get auctioned off right now, sitting at 1.55% or so. And crude has been fluctuating between gains and losses right now. We're up about a tenth of a percent on WTI to $64 a barrel. As for some stocks to watch, come the U.S. Open in about four hours' time. Your biggest outperformers in the pre-market, one of them is GameStop. Already in the last five days, the stock is up more than 100%. It is up another 17% in pre-market trading. Retail investors, Reddit investors, still very active. We also have skills up about 7% after it uh, refuted a short-selling research report from Wolfpack Research. It also reports fourth quarter results after the bell today. And finally, Virgin Galactic up 6.3%. No real news there, Matt, but of course, we always have to keep an eye on Richard Branson Space Company. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I always have been anyway. I love um, following all the space news. I, I want to just point out something. We had a little conversation about trading places and Deutsche Bank. So Hillary put a chart together for me. Um, this is the performance in white and blue of the banks who paid their traders the most, and in yellow, the performance of the bank that pays their call center employees the most. I guess. It's actually not. Um, in white and blue, you see Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley's performance. Um, in uh, yellow, you see Wells Fargo's performance uh, in terms of revenue growth. And I actually stole this uh, idea for this chart from our next guest, Francine. Yeah, I love that. A pullback in Treasury yields calling, of course, the value rotation to question amid improving recovery outlooks and a pause in the big tech exodus. Now, J.P. Morgan EMEA Chief Executive Vis Raghavan weighs in. You will see an element of rotation continue because the reemergence of a yield curve means, you know, banks, financial institutions, etc., are going to really benefit from a, a more NII and the like. But what is also very much the theme here is the incredible stimulus we have seen. If you look at the uh, the uh, the last count, I mean, we are talking about you know, 10 to 12 trillion dollars of quantitative easing that's been injected into the system. We have fiscal stimulus, so all of this money is going to underpin and sustain asset prices. So we are still really bullish on equities. We do see a recovery theme continue. We see GDP growth continue. I think there is pent up demand. I mean, if you take the consumer who's been bottled up in, in lockdowns and the like for the best part of a year now, I think there's really a, a desire to go out and go consume, go spend, start living again. So all of this points to a kind of a healthy economic uh, recovery. So we are still, we are going to see uh, sustained uh, interest in equities. You are continuing to, see, you're going to see an element of rotation happen. 
That was JP Morgan's Viz Raghavan, EMEA chief executive. We also, so that was a conversation on the markets. We also had a conversation about working from home and, of course, paying bankers and how you retain talent. Now, joining us to talk about all of these things, Octavio Morenzi, Optimus founder and chief executive officer. Thank you, Octavio, for joining us. Um, Matt Kelly and I were having, a spir were having a spirited conversation about how you have to pay traders more if you want to make money for a bank. But overall, how do you retain talent post pandemic? Is it, you know, being more flexible on working from home? Do people want that? Do they care about that? Or is it just a bonus pool? Well, I think for investment bankers, it's always the bonus pool that seems to be the most important thing to them. But I, I, th I think that's a really multifaceted question. And I think it also depends in largely sort of the age of the employees and how much experience they have. And I know a lot of younger people very much want to be back in the office and be in that kind of environment. And that fulfills an important social function for them. A lot of the older employees, the older traders, investment bankers are delighted to be working from home and have moved out of London or out of New York and are busily doing all their deals from the countryside somewhere. So that very much depends. But I think the flex Flexibility is the important thing, as you pointed out. Uh, but even if you go back into the office, these younger right. employees, they sometimes find now they're going to really cavernous, empty buildings where there's no one else around, and it's just as depressing as staying at home for them. So can European banks compete with attracting talent you know, against the US Wall Street banks? Uh, I mean, it's it's difficult. I mean, you, you were talking about the call center employees. I think there certainly they can. Uh, so that's that's a relatively straightforward thing to be able to do. On the investment banking side and the trading side, I mean, the U U.S. banks have done so very very well over the course of the past year or so, and that's a very difficult thing to to compete with. Now, individual lines of business in individual asset classes, yes, you can certainly, but you have to pay them top dollar to get them. So, uh, good uh, bond traders, good OTC derivative traders, good FX traders, things like that are, are really at a, at a very high premium right now. So attracting them is simply a question of, of, of paying the salaries they're demanding and looking at the bonuses that they're, they're getting. Uh, but I, I think certain European banks can do it. But I will say the large US investment banks uh, have just had a spectacular run over the course of the past year or so. So that's pretty hard to compete with. Well, I wonder if that's going to change. You know, Octavia, I took this chart from, I took the idea from your note um, we all know that obviously trading revenue has been on fire over the last year and lending revenue has not. That's why, you know, uh, Wells Fargo has underperformed Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. That's also why Deutsche Bank's strategy has kind of shifted um, uh, almost outside of um, savings control. But uh, I wonder if that continues. You know, as we see the yield curve start to um, really steepen up, are the Wells Fargo's or the Deutsche Bank uh, lending arms going to be making more money than the, than the traders? Well, let me say, first of all, I was really impressed that you got that chart together in about three minutes. <laughs> but it seems that you had a bit of a head start in getting it together. But you have you have sort of picked <laughs> the worst class in uh, the worst student in the class, which is which is Wells Fargo. So that's a bank that has some other problems as well. But I think it does illustrate the point that the investment banking side has done fantastically well. Uh, the the lending side, the payment side, credit cards not so hot. Uh, and that's the case around the world, um, but particularly in the, in the U.S. So if you compare uh, a, a Wells Fargo to some of the other invest the other banks that have large investment banking arms, yes, you're going to see a, a huge difference. But Wells Fargo has a bunch of other problems there as well. Now, will that change now in, in the coming year? I mean, so far this year, it's still a story about investment banking and trading. So we haven't seen a big recovery yet in the, in the retail and commercial banking side. What we have seen is now interest rates on the longer end creeping up in the U.S., not in Europe but in the US. So we're seeing a steepening of the yield curve, and that should help the net interest margin at these banks. There is a problem that lending activity is a bit off, um, and the banks have basically sort of run out of people to lend to. Deposits have shot up, so deposits are higher than ever before. People are just plowing, saving lots of money in this environment. So there's just a, they're awash with deposits, awash with cash, and no one left to lend to. So I wouldn't really expect the lending activity to go up that much, but the net interest margin should go up. Now, for something like Wells Fargo, it's I a bit problematic interest rates creeping up because they're dependent on, on, on mortgages and mortgage refinancings a lot. Right. Well, I, I want to I get to that as well. I resent um, your assertion that I prepare my work before the show, Octavio. <laughs> but of course, you have to uh, prepare far before as uh, not only in terms of how you look at banks, but also in your role as chief investment officer. You've got to have a view on what you think rates are going to do. Um, what is it right now? I mean, have we hit a top at 
one and a half, one point six percent, or do you see the ten year going higher? Does the yield curve continue to steepen? Um, do we get yield curve control? What do you expect? I, I expect the Fed is watching this very, very closely, and they've sort of allowed the longer-term rates to creep up while keeping the shorter rates down. So they've done this quite deliberately, I think, in terms of making that happen. There's nothing to stop the Fed from, saying intervening in the 10-year market or the 30-year bond market and starting to buy those bonds up and flatten the yield curve out. But I think for the time being, the Fed is quite happy to see longer-term interest rates going up and, and keeping short ones down. And I think it's specifically to help the banking industry on the retail banking and, and, and sort of the bread-and-butter commercial banking side of things. Mm -hmm. I think that's quite deliberate. Now, that's, of course, really bad for tech stocks. Uh, tech stocks have sort of longer-term horizons where you're discounting cash flows way into the future. Those things then then suffer. So that's a bit of a trade-off the Fed has made there. But I, I think they'll monitor that very closely. At some stage in the next year or so, they are going to be tempted to start to raise interest rates again on the short term. And I see trouble brewing there because a lot of investors are going to run for the exits as soon as that happens. Mm -hmm. So I think once the Fed starts to even think about increasing interest rates again, a lot of people are going to say, OK, let's jump for the doors right now and get out of this before the whole thing sinks and crashes. Octavia, speaking of the Fed, they, of course, granted relief on capital requirements to banks last March. That's going to expire at the end of this month. If that isn't extended, what happens? I don't think very much in terms of capital requirements, because as, as I said, the, the lending amount hasn't really gone up that much uh, and has been flat or decreasing even at many banks, while the deposit bases have gone up enormously. So they've got quite a capital cushion. So the capital requirements, I don't think, are going to be such an issue. There's, it's not going to be a problem for them at all. Uh, they're basically over-reserved at this stage. And so reducing the reserve requirements doesn't really make any difference. They're very far away from reaching those limits at the moment. So that's uh, that should be OK. Now, there's a whole bunch of other capital capital requirements so they can play with a bit, but I think right. those effects will be quite, kind of marginal anyway. Octavio, our most read story on the Bloomberg terminal is that the death of the 60-40 portfolio makes it very hard for funds to return money because of the way bonds have been behaving. Is it something that you worry about? I mean, if you look at the 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 whole money market industry, uh, that's of, of course in 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 trouble as a result of ultra low interest rates. So it's very hard for them to actually make any money in this in this environment. So, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm concerned by that. I mean, these interest rates look very artificially low. Uh, there's no reason for them to be that low. That being said, if, if you compare U.S. interest rates to European interest rates, they're still actually quite high. So if you go out to the 10-year or 30-year range, I mean, in Europe, we've got some negative interest rates on many 30-year government bonds, and, and certainly on the 10 years, from, for most of them in developed Western Europe. So uh, there's still some, uh, some, some space to push interest rates down lower. But if you look at sort of the, the money market funds and things of that sort, they, they suffer in this environment. They uh, can't cover their costs, really, with such low interest rates. Octavio, thank you. Octavio Morenzi there, Opimas, Chief Executive Officer. Now, coming up next, vaccine passports, how the latest push could affect the future of travel. We'll discuss that in length. This is Bloomberg.
our generation's biggest problem. Climate change is happening. And the world's most innovative solutions. Transport, industry, uh, buildings, electricity, all of those things. Everything you need to know about our changing environment, the politics of global warming. We can and we will deal with climate change. In the fight against climate change, Bloomberg Green has you covered. increase our manufacturing uh, capacity. So they, I don't see a limitation why we should not be able to produce even 3 billion doses in 2022. And it really uh, um, uh, depends on the deep demand. It depends on factors, for example, uh, uh, whether, whether the additional boost vaccinations are required. And that was the CEO of BioNTech, Dr. Uger Sahin speaking to me from Mannheim last night. Now, there's a growing push to make vaccine passports a reality. The European Union will, pr will propose a certificate that could ease travel for those who have been vaccinated. And now U.S. airlines are urging the Biden administration to develop virus passports as the country's infections spread at the slowest pace since the pandemic began. So more people would be able to do stuff. To tell us more about what this could mean for uh, uh, the, the global um, uh, situation, Alberto Nardelli of Bloomberg News joins us. And Alberto, first of all, I wonder um, who's come the farthest and, and how soon are we going to see these passports get into the hands of the vaccinated? Um, well, I think we're still some way away. So basically the, what's happening is that the, the European Union is developing a framework that it hopes will allow the certificates that each individual European country develops to be able to interoperate with each other. So, for example, if you get vaccinated in France and you get issued a certificate and then you go to Greece on holiday, the Greek authorities can read that uh, certificate. So this is really a first step uh, in that process. And that regulation is expected to be published later this month on the 17th. And then it's up to all the individual countries to develop their own certificates. And obviously all of this is in parallel to countries actually vaccinating people. So it's still a, a few weeks, if not months away until we actually see the certificates themselves. Alberto, you break news more than anyone I know, actually, in my vicinity. So congratulations on really always being upfront on the news. When you look at the vaccinations, Thank the you. passporting, I mean, it seems like every day it's a UK versus EU spat. They're fighting and fighting and fighting. How will this end? Will even the passports be a point of contention? Um, I think that's a very good, that's a very good, good question. I think there is clearly there is a huge difference between the level of vaccination within the European Union is about six, seven percent now. The UK is over um, 30 percent. And lots of people, rightly or wrongly, perceive that through the prism of Brexit, which creates tensions on the uh, two sides. The spat yesterday evening between uh, the President of the European Council and the British Foreign Minister, the latest um, example of that. I think on the uh, certificates, the system that the, the European Union is de developing now is very much focused on member states. So there could be yeah. some points of tension there if the two sides don't uh, communicate. However, individual member states like Greece and Cyprus have already said that they will develop systems bilaterally with the uh, United Kingdom if something that works across the whole bloc um, isn't produced. So it's likely that Alberto, countries will come up with their own solutions. Alberto, thank you so much. Alberto Nardelli there of Bloomberg News. I know, Matt, I try not to have fights on Twitter. I try really hard, but sometimes you just have to get stuck in. And the only one I've had in 2021 was actually whether it was fair to issue these passports before everyone got vaccinated. And I'm all for it. If you can go on holiday because you're at risk and you've got vaccinated, I have zero problem with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the pushback I've heard from 
airline executives is that it's not fair to people who are young and healthy since the old people get vaccinated first. But that's like saying it's right. not fair to people who are super rich. I mean, you're young and healthy. Take that and stay home and be happy uh, until you get your vaccination. Coming up next, we agree, Matt, finally. We're coming up next, meme stocks wow. are going mainstream. Some of our exclusive interview with the Robin Hood chief executive, Vlad Tenev. This is Bloomberg. He says we should practice before we go to Mars, but some people say we need to practice on the moon. Well, you could practice on the moon, but you can do it at one ten thousandth the cost in the desert in Utah. So Now is your online home for brand new Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. Discover new releases each week that include behind-the-scenes storytelling with conductors including music director Andres Nelsons, guest composers and musicians, plus critically acclaimed archival concerts and more. Visit bso.org forward slash now where the music plays on. BSO season sponsored by Bank of America. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. I think you can look at uh, our, our vision uh, broadly and say that Right now, about half of U.S. households invest. We'd like to get that number up to 95 plus percent. Investing should be as ubiquitous as shopping online. It should just be something that people do. Um, and moreover, I think there's uh, an opportunity to expand that beyond the U.S. There's no reason why the greatest financial system uh, the world has ever seen should be only available to Americans. Uh, we can. We can we can uh, we can make that available uh, globally, and not just to high net worth individuals and the wealthiest one percent globally, but to the mass market. Um, and so I, I think that's a huge opportunity. 
Robin Hood, chief executive there, Vlad Tenev. You can catch that full interview with our Emily Chang at 1 p.m. in New York. Now, uh, Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, also joins us. Tom is a 12-year-old, you know, is she sticking by her inflation call looking at stimulus and still trading on Robin Hood? Well, yeah, she, you know, we're day trading off the couch. <laughs> Vet Bill has lost money three days in a row on GameStop and is really having trouble with it. Francine, let's go to the chart right now. Really quite important. This is for tomorrow, a little economics now. But on stimulus, where exactly are we? This is an original chart. This is what the Bloomberg terminal does so well. This is claims, but adjusted for the rising American population over decades and decades. The miracle of lower claims compared to population, the huge pandemic spike, and then down we go. Francine, that's a good indication of how far we have to go to get back to normal. Yeah, and I love actually, you know, the OECD yesterday was in plain language was basically saying thanks to the stimulus in the U.S., the kind of the, the world will really yeah. get a, a bump up in GDP. You're also looking at, I guess, you know, world affairs with General Stravides. Well, we're looking with uh, General Stravides. We have the Admiral on today, a new book out on China and the possibilities of war down the road. It's an important uh, book. Before that, the joy of Craig Moffat and Michael Nathanson. We do this once a year with these gentlemen. They are absolutely definitive in media to have Moffat Nathanson together as a global Wall Street event. Tom, thanks so much. Tom Keen there, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. I wanted to ask Tom, Matt, whether he was, you know, ready to get his passport once he gets fully vaccinated and leave. But, you know, a lot of people are starting to have those conversations. Well, he'll be able to go to Bergdorf Goodman and uh, pick up a new handbag for a special lady friend. I want to take a look, speaking of Tom, you know, if you're an early surveillance fan, back in the day, John Tucker used to join Tom and read out his 401k, which I love during the financial <laughs> crisis. If he had invested 1% in Bitcoin, I have a chart showing how much uh, he would have made. This is 60-40 in blue, uh, just 1% in Bitcoin, and then like 59-39 um, in stocks and bonds. And look at how well Tucker would have done. Yeah, I love that. I just invest in technology. Kaylee, also in technology and watching US CPI a little bit later. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets. Bruce Kassman from JP Morgan also joins Tom and John. leaders were actually better at controlling the deaths from COVID-19. Do you think out of this pandemic, we'll see more countries be willing to elect female leaders? When we look at women leaders, we tend to project on them baggage that they shouldn't bear. Women are given an opportunity when no one else wants to do the job. Women had a very clear objective. Uh, they wanted to save lives. The women leaders if you look at their careers, have also built up a level of, of trust. In fact, women have to be better at communication in order to be elected uh, as leaders, whereas this doesn't hold true for men. We need to get those sexist stereotypes out of our head and give women a fair run for leadership. Trying to change the stereotypes about women is not only the business of women, but men have to be part of it.
trillion U.S. stimulus. We think that will lift and global GDP could be growth. We're about to have a two trillion dollar stimulus, so the propensity of consumers to spend is very high. Inflation is going to be a burst coming in the next 12 months, and then it's going to calm back down again. This is not a Fed that's going to hike upon a falling unemployment rate, and it's not a Fed that's going to hike when they start to sniff out inflation. They are going to wait. Fed policy inevitably at some point is going to shift. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. 1.9 trillion from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom Keane, a monster plan about to be passed in the House down in Washington, D.C. And radically different, John, than any we have seen in modern history. The deployment here to the lower quartiles of American economic pie is tangible. This will be felt completely differently in the next 6 to 12 months. The trillion dollar question for this market is not about the data and what it'll look like. That data is going to be booming in several months' time, Tom. It's about how we respond to it. Right. That's not an economics question. That's a psychological one for this market. What do we look like at the turn of the middle of this year when that data's booming, and how do market participants respond to that data? Well, I got up from the surveillance nap yesterday, John, and you had on my pad, you texted me the Morgan Stanley upgrade there. We're going to talk to Dr. Kasman of uh, JP. Okay, guys, we sold Bitcoin, as you can see. We sold at 54,739. It gives us half a percent of total investment. Let me, I'll show you. So well done. All of you who decided to follow this trade or who use our strategy, it took us how long? A couple of hours until we we'll make made a profit, quite decent profit. Good. I'll speak to you later. We still have many other positions uh, outside the screen as well. So we're working 24-7. Uh, well done with Bitcoin. In our case, we have 500 pounds in profit. In your case, it's all depends on the, uh, how much you invested. Okay? Good trade. Well done. If you want to get strategy, you can... Uh, Find the strategy from our website, companyi.co.uk. Um, uh, this week, uh, pro, as far as I know, webinar is sold out, so we don't have any spaces available. But next week, probably you will have, uh, if you want to register for webinar, you're welcome. Uh, tomorrow after tomorrow, the company will publish uh, what date and what time it will be uh, running and you can register for a webinar. Otherwise, get the strategy or follow our trades. Try to make some little profit for yourself. Okay, I'll speak to you later. Stay safe. At their final vote on this $1.9 trillion stimulus plan. All eyes on what's next. Do the Democrats have enough political clout, enough political unity to actually get something else done? And how much are they going to look towards stimulating the economy through infrastructure spending and some of the progressive uh, elements? We're going to be speaking uh, with one of the advisors, Jared Bernstein, to President Biden later in this hour at 1 p.m., to your point about bond auctions, John, we're going to be getting, uh, U.S. Uh, is going to be selling $38 billion of 10-year notes. This follows the $58 billion of sales of three-year notes yesterday that went really well. People were worried that we were going to get a repeat of the seven-year auction. We did not. We had the highest bid-to-cover ratio, a sign of how much demand there was. Uh, going back to 2018, and we saw the independent buyers, not necessarily dealers, come in in force, just showing there is a bid to buy bonds with yields as high as they are. That part of the reason why perhaps there was a sense of stability under the market yesterday, John. The test coming at the long end of the curve a little bit later today. Lisa, thank you. Yields are higher this morning on 10s by four basis points, on 30s by almost five to 228 on a 30 year, on a 10 year about 156. The headline Tom Keane from Morgan Stanley yesterday, here's the line for you from Ellen Zetner and the team. Yeah. GDP is now on track to reach its <clears throat> pre-COVID level by the end of the current quarter. Exactly. You nailed it, John. It's a timeline. It's the x-axis right now, and everybody's dealing pro and con. The bets are made in the market, not so much with the y-axis and what's going on, but the timing of all this, John, it's a huge mystery. Let's bring in Bruce Kasman, Tom.